Hey, my name is Michal Drobot, and I'm a technology fellow at Infinity World Activision. This talk presents our geometry rendering Python architecture. Before I start, I want to point out the amazing engineers I had the privilege to work and brainstorm with during GPU Python architecture and creation. Ken Kwa Singh is the primary engineer of UGB effort, as well as the main contributor to GPU pipeline as a whole. Felipe Gomez Fritelli was always there to brainstorm and help. He's also the primary engineer on bindless and mass throwing efforts. Michal Shemchik was our brainstorm partner and helped with CPU side of things. I would also like to extend my thanks to our amazing course organizers. And now, without further ado, let us move to the presentation. Our titles are becoming increasingly complex when it comes to rendering scenarios. Moving from tight and closed spaces to open words literally opened the floodgates for all new rendering challenges. And to top it off, we threw in a lot of foliage which has always been problematic to render at high frame rates. Historically, we had very tight budgets of about 700,000 triangles submitted to GPU per frame. But moving to open world scenarios, our scenes are suddenly hitting 8 million triangles. There's a tenfold difference, same engine, same target platform. Initially, we thought that our lot systems would be able to handle this change, especially as we invested heavily into hierarchical lots as well as baking out parts of the map as proxy lots. While those systems did well, we still couldn't avoid rising triangle count due to depth complexity and occlusion issues that come from long-distance rendering of natural environments. In complex scenes where occlusion is only partial due to sparse occlude diffusion from forests and tons of small asset building cityscapes, fine-grained occlusion becomes paramount. This drastic change required us to totally rethink our geometry submission and processing architecture. So to sum up our problem space, we want to render a significant amount of geometry. Meshes are getting progressively denser, and we're getting close to triangle shading efficiency limits, often hitting triangle per pixel quad level of geometric complexity. This is further exacerbated by implicit meshes, generated through alpha test or some form of tessellation. And finally, occlusion can be probabilistic, often coming from occlude diffusion, thus prohibiting an effective precomputation solution. Activision titles have multiple different well-optimized rendering engines. For our content, we had access to Forward Plus, Deferred, and a prototype Visibility Plus renders. We spent a lot of time assessing which architecture is best for what type of data. So just as a quick reminder, Forward Plus. In Forward Plus, shading happens at geometry draw time. All vertex data is passed from vertex shader stage directly to pixel shader stage. And the PS stage generates per pixel BRDF inputs and shades them. In the third, shading is split in two stages. First, there is a G-buffer fill pass that runs standard vertex to pixel shader pipeline, generates BRDF parameters, and stores them per pixel. This is followed by a compute pass that reads in G-buffer and executes mostly unified shading. Visibility plus. In that type of rendering, geometry is split from shading by storing triangle or vertex references or data per pixel. Then it's followed by a compute pass that generates BRDF parameters and shades them. It's also worth mentioning up front that our material complexity is fairly high. While we do not offer shader graph solutions, we have multiple complex options for mixing and matching BRDFs, as well as some additional on-demand options related to dynamic weathering, night vision, and thermal vision. We found out that nothing can get even close to F plus when dealing with relatively large angles. So as long as you can keep your quad occupancy over 75%, it's just like F plus hands down. The third performs worse in this case, and V plus is not far behind F plus. When it comes to ultra high density meshes, forward plus starts losing the battle with dropping quad occupancy. This is where the third can shine. Depending on how well optimized your V plus is, in example, if you're sharing same light tile optimizations with the third, it can be as fast as the third, albeit it might require a bit more work. Obviously, V plus benefits start outweighing the third as soon as material complexity grows. And then finally, when using alpha tested implicit geometry, it's an actual real killer for all types of renderers. F plus has terrible quad occupancy, hitting as low as 20% in foliage heavy areas. The third needs alpha tested dev pre pass before actual G buffer pass to even be competitive. And in case of V plus, it requires a heavier pre pass for deformable and generative geometry where one needs to store post-animation transform bar centrics of each triangle, if original triangle is available, or store all vertex data per pixel. But even then, V plus has a significant edge over the other rendering methods.
Third plus biggest issue is GPU hardware efficiency when dealing with quads. The third mostly suffers from expensive G-buffer and high memory utilization, especially scaling badly with material complexity. There is additional cost of a prepost that is necessary for heavy overthrow scenes. B plus in general comes in two flavors. Minimal, where we only store triangle ID and run a vertex shader like shader and pixel shader invocations. This approach is not advisable for heavy vertex shaders because it's not generally easy to calculate the thermal geometry again. Exponent storage of vertex data per pixel is advisable for simple vertex data where vertex shader cost is significant. So that would be the case for uh, the thermal geo. Both approaches have significant maintenance and preparation costs. Thus can never be faster than F plus in a, in a simple scene. On the other hand, they provide more balanced performance scaling under different circumstances someone having more advantages of the third and F plus together than their disadvantages, albeit it comes with increased complexity. Furthermore, V plus has a very significant engineering and maintenance cost that mostly stems from need for manual management of derivatives and code complexity that many compilers struggle with. Last but not least, memory footprint and bandwidth changes with vertex complexity when vertex deformation is required. It's a less common case than material complexity scaling, but it still needs to be considered if there's a lot of vertex deformation going on, as it's impractical to run deformation code per pixel. So after all this pre-production research, we decided to focus on hybrid rendering that involves F plus and V plus designs. We would like to use F plus for regular density meshes, complex vertex formats, and deformable geometry, while V plus would be used for dense meshes and simple vertex formats. Our decision comes from the fact that both techniques share several commonalities. Fixed prepass memory footprint, ease of material complexity scaling, as well as both benefit from runtime triangle preprocessing. So before we jump into implementation of our pipeline, I would like to explain some basic terminology of our engine. Our rendering primitives are divided in hierarchical classes. Batch is a single invocation of rendering API draw, whether that's draw indirect or draw indirect index. It's composed of many serves. A serve points to different parts of meshes, where meshes as a construct are only art facing. Serves are split based on their non mergeable material splits, and they are composed of many clusters. And a cluster is basically a 64 triangle strip. In order to implement the full GPU driven pipeline, we had to do some preliminary work first. First, we had to allow access to all geometry data from single shader invocation. Systems maintaining this access are called UGB, Unified Geometry Buffers. Then we had to provide our meshes as unified pre-generated triangle clusters. And finally, divide all work units into hierarchies that allow progressive workload expansion with interstage calling. UGB is a virtualized memory pool for all geometry. It basically makes our rendering bypass standard vertex streams and input assembly in favor of manual software vertex data resolve. This allows multiple new optimization extensions such as arbitrary data packing. For each serve, we keep a base offset into UGB data that is used during resolve via vertex ID. Procedurally generated data is also part of UGB. It is using a special memory buffer to store procedurally generated data in format matching baked UGBs in order to provide unified vertex data interfaces. Resolving all vertex data loads is software allows bypassing regular API calls necessary for front-end setup. In effect, significantly offloading CPU loads. Furthermore, it allows lot management and merging of draw calls for different lots, because data loads are generated on the GPU via geometry pipeline. It's worth noting that there's additional performance costs associated with losing uh, input assembly front-end on some platforms, but we didn't observe performance degradation in practice. Same can be said about manual data resolve via vertex ID. If you would like to see how easy it is to use the shader facing APIs for UGBs, check out our bonus slides. So let's look at the data flow in our UGB implementation. First, we have the mesh stored on the drive. Then, requested mesh data gets copied from storage to DRAM using DMA jobs. And then, another CPU job gets kicked off to see copy the data to GPU accessible memory. This process results in filling some pages of a large physical GPU UGB buffer with visible mesh subsets. At the same time, we need the GPU to update a software page table to correctly manage all pages in this giant buffer. The page table is sized to be able to contain all meshes in the game throughout the lifetime of the executable. 
Otherwise, you would need to manually garbage collect them. In the case of consoles and certain other devices, we have unified memory architecture, which significantly simplifies UGB management. GPU is backed by same virtualization mechanism as DRAM, because those memory sus subsystems are shared. So first couple of steps of the pipeline are pretty much the same. With the caveat that there is no dedicated VRAM copy step. Also, instead of maintaining software virtualization, we rely on hardware implementation and just update global page tables. This setup cuts down copies and total memory requirements at the cost of frequent virtual page table updates. Certain platforms have high cost of virtual page table updates, thus one needs to strike a balance between page size and per frame page table update counts. Another important step is mesh data preparation that happens inside our mesh converter. Each mesh is cut into 64 triangle size chunks. Those are optimized for index range, position locality, and normal locality. Any reminders are filled with invalid degenerate triangles. Converter also generates additional data payloads, that is cluster call data, cluster compression data, and cluster vertex payload. Cluster call data consists of a bounding box and a cone of occlusion. Cone of occlusion is generated by fitting a minimum aperture cone over all phase normals within the cluster. Both pieces of the data are heavily quantized and compressed. Cluster compression data is a data header that describes how a specific cluster was compressed. It allows variable size of each cluster data payload at cost of direct pointer storage to data payloads. So measures can be optimized within cluster ranges. First, we can compress index data using delta compression. We begin by finding a minimum index within the cluster and then use it as an offset to all indices stored in the cluster. Now all indices can be stored as offsets to the first index, quantized such as they can cover maximum index distance within the cluster itself. For the compression convenience, we use multiples of bytes. We can use a similar logic for position quantization against cluster bounding box. This can, however, get somewhat tricky due to mesh water tightness, like you need to pay special attention and care needs to be taken for quantization depending on device rendering precision and the data quantization you actually want to store. Now we can move to the definition of our workgroups and hierarchies. So workgroup is a basic unified unit of work in our GPU pipeline. It contains 64 items worth of work. Each stage operates on workgroups, first processing them, and then expanding to next level of hierarchy. The rough order would go like this. First, we would be processing batches, those would get processed and expanded into models, those would get processed and expanded into clusters, and those would get processed and expanded into triangles. And then we would be using a common GP workgroup argument interface. So basically, we would be using following functions, regardless of the type of the data they are storing. That allows our pipeline to be fully unified, regardless of the stage it's actually operating on. And the final per frame unit of work is a worker representing a cluster of triangles, which is stored as an Einstein in 64 with each bit representing a single triangle. No stage ever needs all bits. Therefore, some bits are used as per workgroup arguments for next stage processing. There are multiple stage related bits packing and unpacking APIs we use in order to repurpose our workgroups. So here you can see a couple of different flags we would use depending on the use case. Like let's say we could decide if a cluster is actually visible in shadows or not, and then we'll reuse the same workgroup um, data, uh, data format for different processing of clusters or triangles. Initially, the CPU used to handle model calling and lot selection. However, in a world of mass instancing and increasingly complex lot logic, this quickly became the bottleneck. We were looking for a way to offload all this complex logic to GPU, thus introduce simplified model collections and simple hierarchies. So our data preparation on the CPU side starts by CPU kicking off multiple threaded batch creation jobs. They generate static model, we call them S models, runtime collections. Each S model has the, the transform data pre-computed, so we, it, it's it happening in the map pre-compile step. And all S models sharing the same material are furthermore pre-built into an AABB hierarchies. Then those hierarchies can be used at runtime for rough calling, lot range selection for collections, memory residency checks, and we can also concatenate the same material into a single batch. <laughs> 
CPU jobs also generate a reverse lookup table that matches S models to materials in common batches. So for each S model index stored in the batch ID and material ID, GPU would get access to material data relevant to calling. Different serves concatenate the same material draws, and finally resolve and fill in direct arcs matching the CPU draws. So this, this creates a bidirectional hierarchy where the GPU can resolve bottom up and top bottom. So basically, at the level of a triangle, we can resolve all the way back to which batch or material generated the triangle. And then from a material or batch, we can go all the way down to a single triangle. So all this data is stored at the various levels of motor hierarchy structures that you can check out in our bonus section. We run a very similar process for dynamic movable models. The main difference is that we need to generate all transform data on the fly and generate unified input data for multiple different types of dynamic geometry. This covers standard dynamic rigid models and procedurally placed models such as Cladder, which is our dynamic placement system for foliage and small decorator meshes. Models that are deformed or generated on the fly need a bit more attention. Skinned models output transform vertices into intermediate data buffers that are read by the GPU pipeline as if they were part of the static data. And other exotic model types use similar caching mechanisms or they need to opt out of the GPU pipeline. All stages use visibility binary masks stored as unsigned in 64. They are used to represent intermediate calling data for each entity stage. This optimization for data processing allows multiple interesting algorithms. In example, there is a fast binary operation where processing multiple views. It becomes efficient and trivial to find sums or intersections of triangles from multiple views. Furthermore, it allows us to minimize memory bandwidth and storage required throughout the frame as we only need to store one bit per triangle. Then index buffers are expanded from bitmass on demand. This on demand expansion also allows us to store source index data in a highly compressed form that is independent from the index buffers that are actually used throughout the frame. So if you were to look at, let's say, an index buffer for a single cluster, and that could be concatenated down to triangles, those triangles might be visible or not. So let's say if we were to have the triangle 0 and triangle 2 visible, we would store this visibility mass as 101. So now let's go through our work group expansion pipeline step by step. We start with a CPU job collecting model batches. This step generates batch data for multiple input geometry types. There will be the cluster data, static models, dynamic models, and skin models. This is followed by a CS job that expands batch data to serves, at which point multiple input batches become expanded and unified to dynamic serves and static serves. This is followed by a CS job that does serve calling and blot selection, outputting called serve data. And the next step runs compute job that compacts the data on called serve data. And finally, there is a compute job that expands serves into triangle clusters. Generating work groups, representing clusters along with their original surface ID references. So now we can move to the final stage that operates on clusters of triangles and actual triangles. We start with the cluster stage data <coughs> generated by the previous stage. It goes for a compute job cluster calling job that finally generates cluster visbit masks. Then those are going for another compute job that does the compaction and it's stored again as a visbit mask with additional data after compaction. Now we can move to the cluster stage that expands to triangle workgroups. A CS job expands clusters into triangle workgroups, followed by another job that does triangle calling generating final call triangle visbit masks. And the next step is another compaction job, generating final triangle visbit buffer ready for on-demand index expansion. So the triangle index expansion job can however alter the ordering of final triangles at cluster granularity. So if we would go back to the cluster stage, we can have another compute job that would do cluster depth sorting. And that would generate a depth sorted cluster workgroup in direction buffer in our case, in front to back order for efficient drawing of opaques, or back to front order for transparent triangle class rendering. This data can be finally consumed by triangle index expand job to generate potentially semi-sorted triangle index buffers for index and non-index rows. <laughs>
So now let's quickly move to cluster calling overview. We utilize fairly basic calling tests. Frostum to test if triangles would end up inside the frostum. The generate test to test if a cluster didn't end up uh, malformed by transforms. Missing sampling point to test if a cluster would have a chance to actually render at all. And the cone occlusion to test if all triangles within the cluster will be back facing. Furthermore, we have optional occlusion calling paths. For pre-pass, we use CPU-generated dev buffer of the scene, and for transparencies, we use hierarchical dev buffer of the scene generated from the pre-pass -pre dev. Both tests use cluster bounding box checks against aforementioned dev sources. Compaction steps are shared between different workgroup types. Each workgroup uses a visbit mask that is first counted, and then processed by parallel prefix sum, outputting data for indirect row or indirect dispatch arguments, as well as offset buffers for to surviving blocks of entities. Triangle calling is similar to cluster calling. It uses pretty much the same calling tests. Occlusion pass can use the same data as cl cluster calling. One big addition to triangle calling is our visibility buffer fine calling that we will be discussing in a minute. So arguably, when you compare cluster calling to triangle calling, triangle calling is definitely more expensive, but this is the one that actually yields very significant improvements over cluster calling. Like in, in case of this tarp, we're looking at 32k triangles that went down to 30k triangles with cluster calling, all the way to 7.2k triangles with per triangle calling. And you can see similar kind of performance when it comes to like more regular meshes, like let's say a sphere. So the final stage is all triangle workgroups and their vis masks. Read can happen in sort order using indirection sort table. Then indices are decompressed from stored mesh cluster index data, compacted on the fly, and written out to vertex shape consumable data formats. Triangle index expand job generates two output types of vertex shader consumable data. One for index rows used for F plus lead passes. Those rows consume three times 32 uh, bit indices. Each index is stored as surface ID, triangle ID, and those are like 16 bits and 16 bits, and are used and consumed by lead pass index indirect rows. Where the vertex shader reads input directly via SV vertex ID, and extract 16-bit surface ID to load surface data. Another output is for non-index rows used by V plus prepass. Those rows consume one time 24-bit workgroup ID cluster and one times 8-bit triangle ID in workgroup. Vertex shader needs to indirect result triangle ID and surface ID. To minimize the bandwidth, uh, three vertices are decoded from single 32-bit payload. All submit rows use indirect row and indirect index row interfaces. Therefore, they can store additional PERT row data in base vertex location that we use for PERT row vertex offsets and in start instance location that we use for auxiliary data. It's worth noting that consoles allow even more data passing. You can see an example of vertex data loading code for various paths in our bonus slides. Our visibility buffer stores different data depending on row type. We'll go into details a bit later. The important thing right now is that data can use up to 64 bits per pixel, making prepass somewhat expensive. Using our VRS pipeline allows to significantly improve prepass performance. Due to 4x MSA8 half resolution rendering, shader invocations are cut up to 75%. The negative side of this is that the effect is that we duplicate all non edge pixels. In general, this is a non-issue for triangle ID, as it's coherent on per-triangle basis. But on other data, such as UVs, one needs to reconstruct the data and potentially interpolate it if it's directly stored in the visibility buffer. Here you can see some performance numbers for usage of our VRS MSA pipeline. And there are clear gains ranging from 5 to 30%, depending on how heavy the pre-plus shaders are, helping them most with heavy alpha test overthrow. So in the case of a heavy alpha test overthrow, which is the scene that you can see in the background of the slide, we're looking at a very significant gain of 29% when rendering in 2 megapixels, and 20% when rendering in 1 megapixel where quad occupancy starts killing us slowly. 
With more balanced geometry seen when there is not that much of alpha test and the pre-plus shaders are actually faster, the gain is still noticeable, but not as much as with alpha test. Here you can see a comparison of non-MSA pre -pass versus MSA pre -pass for aforementioned scene. So if you look at the waveform distribution, you can clearly see that MSAA using the SV coverage unroll results in significantly less waves, as the pressure on the pixel shader expert allocation is much less, resulting in shorter execution time. So here you can see that all those waves are actually somewhat long, and, and you know, like there are like many of those waves. Whereas here you can see that a lot of waves actually got shortened and compacted, and the waves that were longer are only the ones that actually need to export a bit more of the data via SV coverage. So we're looking for some further optimizations for our visibility buffer uh, alpha test rendering. Arguably, our alpha tested rendering has always been pretty optimized. We use multiple techniques throughout our projects. We use depth prepass with depth equal for lit passes. We converted high resolution alpha maps to assigned distance fields. And we pre even tried pre-baking optimized index buffers for bushes and trees for multiple viewpoints. But even with all those optimizations, rendering dense followed is still a challenge. So the main problem with alpha test is the overthrow in prepass that is exacerbated by most GPU optimizations being off when rendering with alpha test. So you don't really benefit that much from hierarchical Z. Also, the rendering order really matters. So in order to give the GPU a chance to call anything, we need to make sure it renders in front to back order as tightly as possible. Therefore, during cluster processing, we run a radix sort compute job that generates a reordering table for all the clusters. And this table is used only in index buffer expansion paths, which allows us to output all triangle clusters in correct front to back order. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee that the triangle will really render in order, but pre-sorting gives a high probabilistic chance of a more efficient early Z calling. So here you can see a scene when, where the camera is fairly low on the ground and can actually see through a lot of grass. And the first view over here is typical unsorted. It's basically like a lot of mostly random clusters of triangles rendered. After sorting, you can see the color coding here shows you the depth from the camera. Everything is perfectly sorted up to 64 triangles. So alpha tested geometry is a prime candidate for sorting optimizations due to very high pixel shader cost. Almost all alpha tested geometry uses the same shader permutation. Therefore, we can submit all in one row by automated merging. However, this approach forces us to use bindless texturing, which has a non-trail cost on AMD GCN GPUs. GCN architecture needs to scalarize texture and sampler descriptors, which not only results in significant slowdown on divergence, but also can result in suboptimal code generation. We found out that sorting cost and added cost from bindless textures outweigh the benefit of early Z. However, if we, would, uh, if we could actually avoid the cost of bindless, an example via content preparation to use atlases or using a different GPU architecture that doesn't have the penalty of bindless, we can very clearly see performance wins. So if we are looking at alpha test with sorting off, you can see that pretty much all the waves are kind of like running long and you know they're actually executing something. And then when we actually do the sorting pass, you can see that only the front waves, those that actually started the, the, the batch, do a lot of work. And then they get progressively shorter and shorter because they get called and called. So in terms of the performance gains, we're looking at something like, you know, like up to maybe 25% of, of the gain. But that is with a caveat that you're actually using something that's non-bindless, at least on GCN architecture GPUs. We also tried sorting of non-alpha tested geometry. Again, we started by rendering it using a single Uber shader by automated merging. Unfortunately, we found out that sorting cost and added cost from Uber shader outweighs the benefit of early Z. Prepass pixel shaders are just not expensive enough to, to, to warranty that this cost would, would get, you know, like would be safe. Furthermore, based on our experience, it is hard to find game content scenes with extremely high opaque mesh overthrow, assuming there is any kind of course occlusion calling in the engine. Lack of overthrow makes this technique somewhat less useful for non-alpha tested geometry. So now let's talk about prepass shading, like the way how we actually generate the prepass buffer. In order to fill visibility buffer with triangle ID, we need to have a way to actually generate triangle ID in pixel shader stage. Index rows have short vertices between triangles, therefore there is no way to have a consistent unique triangle ID in a pixel shader. We explicitly disable indexing only for rows that need to generate vplus buffers. 
This is exactly what happens on PC in the driver when you request SV Triangle ID in the pixel shader. And this is also the reason why GPU pipeline index expand stage needs to support dual outputs, index and non-index. Triangle ID per pixel is an extremely powerful piece of information as it can be used to resolve back any kind of information that is related to a triangle that passed all visibility testing per pixel. It can be used by multiple different algorithms as well as for fast triangle calling before forward plus lid throws. It's also worth noting it would be very interesting to have native hardware support for Triangle ID, potentially being part of DB blocks allowing a vertex shader only pipeline. So now let's take a look at our F plus calling pipeline using the visibility buffer. Our calling pipeline is split at the beginning depending on input data. First, we start with compute job for calling of transparent triangles. This job uses hierarchical dev buffer as input for calling and uses it for simpler hierarchical triangle bounding box checks to mark triangle this bits. Then we run another compute job for opaque triangles. This job, on the other hand, reads the triangle ID buffer from prepass and uses it to directly mark surviving triangle this bits. So we just grab the triangle ID, we find the right bit in the this bit mask, and we just mark it. At that point, we have common processing for both paths, as both produce visbit masks for surviving triangles. So the next step is a compute job that compacts it and generates a new visbit mask that are compacted, followed by a compute job that does triangle index expansion into vertex share consumable data for index and non-index rows where applicable. We use visibility buffer triangle ID to find how triangles before opaque paths. First, we zero out surviving triangle visbits from prepass visbit mask. Then we scan the visibility buffer for surviving triangles stored as triangle ID per pixel. We concatenate pixels from surviving triangles and mark relevant visbits in final visbit buffer. This process will result in triangle perfect calling. Regarding performance, it runs close to bandwidth speed on consoles. They generate scaling with triangles from different clusters in the same processing tile. If you need to read visibility buffer for vplus setup, this basically counts for free. And furthermore, MSA VRS setups yield significant speedups, as an 8x8 thread group can scan up to four planes of 8x8 pixels using MSA compression for bandwidth improvements. It's worth noting that transparencies are called with hierarchical depth buffer because we don't have triangle IDs for them. So let's take a look at some pre-plus fine calling performance. This is a very heavy overdrive forest scene. It's an extremely hard scenario for hierarchical depth calling due to depth porosity. So first you can look at our basic triangle count. We're looking at 2.6 million triangles. First we run a pre-pass call cluster, which is pretty much the same for both setups. And then we run pre-pass calling tries, which again runs in the pre-pass data, so there is no visibility buffer available yet. And now the interesting part. So we have the lit pass depth occlusion calling on the per triangle basis. So for each triangle, we grab the depth buffer, we basically grab the hierarchical depth buffer that we just generated after you know, generating the, the, the pre-pass, and we try to call those triangles. And in this case, we're paying about 1.01 millisecond to call the, the remaining surviving uh, about half million of triangles. So this is still actually a lot. Like, like we, we basically managed to reduce it from 1.1 million to about half million at the cost of one millisecond. But then if we were to actually use our vBuffer occlusion calling, we can reduce it all the way down to 85,000 at a cost of 0.21 millisecond. So, so this is a tremendous improvement, not only in the triangle counts, but it's also a huge improvement in terms of actual performance because it just costs 0.21 millisecond versus one millisecond for processing all surviving triangles and, and it's pixel perfect. Furthermore, using MSAA reduces the cost down to 0 0.0 millisecond. If you're interested in pseudocode for, uh, for this step, you can check it out in our bonus section. But overall, this is like a, a, it's like a giant step forward from hierarchical depth occlusion calling for triangles. It's not only faster, but it also calls significantly more triangles. So perfect triangle calling results in a lot of benefits. There's no wasted vertex shader work, there are no empty rows, and there's no parameter cache stall because everything that's in the parameter cache is actually used by pixel shader. And every single row is fully pixel shader bound. 
Such setup almost suggests trying to front load as much work as possible in the vertex shader. In general, because there's no wasted parameter cache memory, you can use more interpolators than usual. One expensive thing we tried moving to vertex shaders is global illumination. Global illumination resolve place in our pipeline is quite an interesting subject on its own. Over the years, we have been going back and forth between vertex and pixel shader resolves, depending on triangle per pixel ratios in our titles. Currently, with fine triangle culling, it makes more sense to resolve it per triangle. On the other hand, full V plus rendering pipeline is significantly easier to implement with a pixel shader result. So this is also why we currently keep uh, our pixel shader and vertex shader implementation of the of the GI pipeline at parity, and we can switch at any time per material. So if you'd be looking at our typical draw calls without uh, pixel perfect GPU calling, I actually believe like this screenshot shows you um, here called depth calling only. You can still see a lot of wavefronts that are actually just uh, running vertex shaders. Green boxes indicate vertex shader work, and orange boxes indicate pixel shader work. So even with depth calling um, of bounding boxes of triangles against the hierarchical depth buffer, there's still tons of wasted work. And now, if we throw out every single triangle that's not visible in the final image using pixel perfect triangle calling, we end up with really tight and much more efficient rendering. So let's take a look at some results from several scenes that are representative of typical game scenarios. Uh, we have a forest scenario here, a building scenario, and kind of like one of our test scenes. So, so you can see that with hierarchical Z calling, uh, we're in general able to save about 20, 20 something percent of the frame time. So we're going down in terms in case of our forest scene from 25 milliseconds of total rendering cost. Um, which is basically the cause of the pipeline running, pre-pass running, and opaque, and that's 25 milliseconds, all the way down to about 19 milliseconds. So the pipeline cost is somewhat elevated, it's quite expensive because we need to do all this um, depth testing per triangle. Pre-pass gets much cheaper, and for pre-pass, well, we, we still need to do uh, triangle calling without the visibility buffer. And the opaque cost is at 12 milliseconds, down about 4 milliseconds from 16 milliseconds. Then with the V-plus buffer calling, our pipeline is actually much faster. We're still saving almost one millisecond versus the high Z calling system because it's just so much faster to do it using triangle marking. Prepass is obviously the same cost, and the peg goes down by another, you know, roughly 2.5 millisecond with a total cost at 16.5 millisecond. So it's a huge improvement. From 25.7 millisecond, we went down to 16.5. And you can see similar gains in other scenes, like they, they vary depending on the content, but in almost every scene, we're looking at at least 30% uh, frame time reduction, up to 50% frame time reduction, in this, this kind of like laboratory test case where you have like tons and tons of triangles uh, that are kind of like nicely laid out in terms of occlusion. So now we can we can talk a bit more about you know how the V buffer setup is generated and what we can actually do with our visibility buffer. So one word of warning first: this pipeline is currently in R and D and is highly experimental, and we did not actually implement uh, visibility plus rendering yet in any shipping titles. So that said, our V plus setup relies heavily on the existing GPU pipeline. First, we start by rendering the triangle ID buffer during pre pass. This is followed by scanning triangle ID buffer as usual to mark visibility bits. And then triangle ID buffer is used to resolve batch ID. So we generate a batch ID buffer from our triangle ID buffer by resolves. And this triangle ID buffer is written out into a material batch ID buffer that is stored as a D16 depth buffer. While outputting this buffer, we also generate custom HiZ metadata at the same time, which is going to allow us to optimize the rendering pipeline a bit farther later. While scanning um, the, the triangle, batch, triangle buffer, we generate a quote for each unique batch ID found within the tile of a triangle ID buffer. Those quotes are stored in 32 bits and added to our regular GPU pipeline index buffer. First 16 bits store tile position, and the remaining 16 bits store batch ID. This is followed by a regular GPU pipeline processing where all visbit masks get updated automatically bypassing the quad lists. This is followed by a triangle stage 
compaction, and finally the expansion step. During expansion, quad indices get expanded into actual quads. Quads are generated as extended triangles where triangle body covers the quad in question. Culling of triangle extent can be done by alternating tile depth or alternating stencil front back stencil mask and using a stencil bit. This is essential to avoid wasting threads on the triangle diagonals because most GPUs render quads with two triangles. Generated quads can then be consumed by vertex shader stages along regular called index meshes. And finally, touch ID buffer is set as a dev buffer for quad triangle raster paths, where throws are rendered as regular throughout the pipeline, but use expanded quads for rasterization. So in order to efficiently render our V plus throws, we need to set newly generated dev buffer, representing batch ID buffer, with manually generated high Z. Using batch ID buffer as a dev buffer will allow the GPU to do all the hard work, making sure waves are optimally constructed up to silhouette quads. All V plus batches are submitted just like our regular batches using GPU pipeline and reading customized index buffers as well as using depth test set to equal. Vertex shader will read indices and reconstruct them into quads. And then pixel shader can run regular F plus code with additional header that is used to manually recreate the vertex shader interpolator data that varies between V plus row types. And optionally, all formats can read tangent frame directly from V buffer if it's used for various preprocessing passes like SSAO or SSR. So depending on our V plus uh, batch type, whether it's terrain, it's implicit geometry or regular V plus model, we had different setup for our V plus buffer. The most canonical one is the V plus model setup where we only store a triangle ID and reconstruct everything else using that triangle ID and reading the data from the, from the vertex payloads. For implicit geo, that's deformable, we store normals and texture LODs and UVs per pixel. And then for our V plus terrain, we just store some auxiliary vertex data because, because our terrain can actually be fully reconstructed from word space positions. So now let's talk about you know, our performance and the nightmare scenario. So this is the nightmare scenario. It's a tessellated terrain covered in alpha to the cross. Tessellation displacement mapping generates its own problems with regards to quad occupancy due to tiny triangles. And foliage, on the other hand, generates tons of quads due to depth complexity and alpha cutouts, even if base level triangle is manageable. So let's look at some numbers. Following numbers should be taken with a grain of salt. They're not from our runtime, rather from our replay framework. And shaders have similar functionality, but V plus is not fully optimized yet and it still lacks support for certain features. That said, we can objectively observe much improved quad occupancy, where loss below 100% occurs only due to drogal silhouette edges from foliage on terrain overlap, in example. This could be mitigated in fully bindless pipeline at the additional cost of the shader complexity and more expensive constant loading. However, in our experience, this is not yet a win with regards to optimization we still have in progress. So we were looking at the case of, let's say, you know, like foliage. For a plus foliage, uh, quad occupancy is in about 48% with our VRS layout, whereas with V plus layout, we're at 87%, which is, you know, it's a huge gain. Basically, we can expect those throws to perform at least 30-40% faster. And that's exactly what the numbers are showing. A drogal went down from 3.8 millisecond to 2.4 millisecond. For terrain, it's, again, a very similar story. F plus has a quad occupancy of 53% with VRS layouts, and it goes all the way up to 89 with V plus terrain. And the gain here is a bit less just because triangles are a bit more, you know, like reasonable. However, as soon as we enable TND, we're looking at a staggering quad occupancy of 18%, which makes our GPU pretty much useless at this point, versus again 89% for uh, V plus terrain. And then when you look at the timings, it's 3.3 milliseconds versus 0.87 milliseconds. So, so this makes the TND terrain almost the same speed as regular terrain. And we're really, really excited about those results because they, they allow us to squeeze even more for our pipeline. And those, those results are definitely worth the whole effort. So now about the future development. In the future, we would like to support a hybrid F plus and V plus rendering on tile basis. V plus pre plus stage can estimate quad occupancy per tile and then use heuristics to pick the best optimal rendering mode for each tile. 
as we were discussing strengths and weaknesses of different renderers, uh, one important thing was that there nothing can actually beat third plus when it comes to large triangles, like well-behaved tiles with large big triangles. Because, you know, this is where GPU really shines, this is what it's made to do, this is where the hardware can really help you. But then as soon as we get into heavy quad occupancy overthrow, forward plus is, is just becoming somewhat a burden. Then we would like to switch to, to visibility plus buffer rendering. So once we do this heuristic estimation, then the draws would be submitted on demand per tile basis. So some tiles would use F plus and some would use V plus. We expect lower resolution to gracefully fall back to V+, plus because with lower resolutions, the quad occupancy is going to grow higher because you have you know, more triangles per pixel technically if the resolution is dropping, while higher resolutions are going to probably use more F+, plus tiles, and this is what our you know, like small test case was showing. It's also important to know that to make this pipeline work, you're going to have to submit your draw calls twice because you're going to have to submit row call once for F+, plus and once for V+, plus, and then you know do all the crazy stencil-based tiling uh, evictions. But if the GPU pipeline is already implemented, and it's already fast to actually shoot those row calls, or even better if you're like running fully bindless and your platform doesn't prohibit you from running fully bindless, this is expected to be a huge, huge win. So this ends this talk, and um, I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you.